Okay. Um, just bring up the slide here. Just like to welcome you all to uh, the slightly delayed Open Data Institute uh, lunchtime lecture. My name is uh, Timothy Hill, and um, I am principal technologist with the Open Data Institute. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Um, today's lunchtime lecture will be given by uh, Robin Gower with Swirl and Ross Bowen uh, from the Office for National Statistics. Uh, Ross and Robin will today be talking about CSVW. This is a standard for describing and clarifying the content of S CSV records, uh, very much the workhorse of the data world, as I'm sure most people on this call will be familiar. And they'll be talking about how this uh, standard CSVW helps make working with CSV easier. Uh, just a couple of pieces of housekeeping. Uh, first of all, please, could you all turn off your cameras and microphones for now, as we will be recording the session. We'll be taking some questions at the end of the talk. Uh, please do submit your questions uh, as the talks go on using the chat function. And after the talk, I'll ask you to unmute one by one so that you can ask your question. Otherwise, I'll be happy to ask that question uh, for you in the chat. Uh, but for now, thank you very much, and over to Ross and to Robin. Thanks, Tim. I should just first check that everyone can hear me, given that all the checking that we did before we changed. I okay. can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Okay. Hi, my name is Robin. Uh, my colleague Ross and I would like to talk to you today, as Tim has said, about a relatively new collection of standards from the World Wide Web Consortium called CSV on the Web. Ross and I are both very enthusiastic about the potential of CSVW to revolutionize how we publish open data. And we've adopted it as the foundation in our work together on the integrated data service as we work across government to try and find new ways of disseminating statistics and reference data. Although we're approaching this from the perspective of data producers and publishers, we're speaking very much from our own personal experience as analysts. And I think the, this is, the lessons go both ways. So we'll each speak in turn, and I'll begin by explaining the motivations for CSVW and providing a brief taste of what it looks like. Ross will then provide a more thorough treatment with examples of how it works in practice. Just in case uh, people aren't already familiar with the acronym CSV itself, I should say that this means comma separated values, and that's just a simple file format for tables of data. So I'd like to Dig it. Did I share my slides? I was about to say. <laughs> right, okay. Um, sorry. Um, so I'd like to begin by inviting you to reflect uh, on data quality and what does it make, uh, what does it mean to make good open data? Tim Berners-Lee, the uh, inventor of the web and linked data initiator, suggested a five-star deployment scheme for open data. Stars one to three, release it, make it structured, use open formats, can be achieved by publishing a CSV. That doesn't help us unlock the final two stars, um, which are about letting other people work with our data and joining our data up with theirs. And as we'll see, the CSV W standard helps us achieve this with some really simple tools. So ultimately, putting CSVs on the web lets us integrate linked, uh, into the linked open data cloud. Connecting data sets together allows us to enrich is each to enrich the value of the others. So let's begin with CSV itself then. Open data pioneers among us will remember that 10 to 15 years ago, we were crying out for CSV rather than grappling with tables of um, PDFs and tables and Word files, CSV really meant machine readable access. APIs at that stage are sort of a mythical creature, and I'm glad to say that our expectations and the standards have risen since then. But we shouldn't um, drop the humble CSV in our excitement for machine-to-machine -machine communication. CSV also serves non-technical users very well. Everyone can read and edit CSV files in a spreadsheet application or a text editor. And indeed, even technical users um, will find them trivial to, to work with programmatically for the most part. And if the evolution of tech trends and standards can teach us anything, it's that simplicity will out. So we all know, though, that CSV isn't perfect. Indeed, for many, the bar's set too low. 
Um, although the Internet Engineering Tax Task Force published a standard, um, it's not particularly strict, and you're still forced to handle many different interpretations in the wild. As with encoding, uh, parsers typically have to resort to trial and error. CSV itself also doesn't declare data types or really provide any promises about the contents of the CSV or its interpretation. So when working with CSV, you inevitably have to devote time to data preparation. CSV on the web should help us to interpret and connect data. So this is a nice and simple example using a data set on grip bins published by Leeds City Council via Data Mill North. We can't tell from looking at the file, this section in the, in the gray box at the top, uh, like an extract from the gripbins.csv. We can't tell from looking at that directly, but the file's accompanied with a textual description on the web page that shares it. And it tells us that each row in this file is a grip bin with an ID for its location and a pair of geo coordinates in the remaining two columns. Further, we can see that the geo coordinates are eastings and northings. Um, so we can infer with a bit of background knowledge and context that that corresponds to the Ordnance Survey National Grid, uh, which is in the OSGB 36 projection. This description helps me as a human to interpret the file or at least it gives me um, some terms to go off and do a bit of searching on the web to make sense of it. But the definition itself isn't machine readable. So what might it look like if it were? Now we've declared the same description using CSV on the web. We have a column specification, which gives variable names to each of the three columns. That makes our programs easier for humans to read because we can refer to the names instead of thinking ordinarily in terms of columns one, two, and three. And it's even better than open text headers, like you might um, see in a spreadsheet or, or indeed a CSV, because we know that they're syntactically valid, which means that they won't need escaping when we work with them in code. The specification also explains each column's data type. So a parser knows how to represent them in our programming language or tool of choice. And finally, we have identifiers that declare the coordinate system using Ordnance Survey's own linked data vocabularies. So these are the official way of saying unambiguously uh, that it's an easting and a northing. And if you look that, that URI up there, it'll tell you what an easting and a northing is. Uh, and um, you can be in working with it from there. So the tools that already work with the Ordnance Survey vocabulary can now work with this data set uh, just through this declaration. And indeed, although it's not um, uh, shown here, CSV on the web gives each of the cells in our original table their own identifiers. So people can now work with this data set in turn. So here's our um, um, a machine readable version of what we, we saw before. So let's take a minute to reflect on the complexity that was hidden underneath the apparent simplicity of that example. CSV on the web uses a standard called CSV dialect so that you can declare, for example, what type of field separators are in use. Is it tabs? Is it commas? It also establishes a sensible convention so that you can typically forget about that or at least not have to worry about it. Um, by declaring data types using the XML schema standard and some validations, you're also able to leave the parsing to your favorite languages CSV library not have to worry about writing custom ingestion code for it either. The contents of the CSVW, unlike a generic CSV table, are guaranteed to be tables. Um, you're also ensured, as I say, that you've got syntactically valid variable names, which makes writing the code, addressing the columns much nicer. CSV fragment identifiers, another standard that's fed into CSVW, mean that every um, CSV file also has URIs, so, um, identifiers for the tables, the rows, the columns and the cells. So you can even combine groups of tables with foreign key relations like in a relational database. Together, these um, identifiers get us to the fourth star. People can point to things in our CSV file. The fifth star comes when we start to integrate our CSV with the rest of the linked data cloud. 
we can find URIs and vocabularies online and start describing our data in a common language. We can do this incrementally and even divide responsibility between domain experts who are editing the data in the spreadsheet and the technical developers declaring the machine instructions in the metadata. So that concludes the lightning introduction. I'll now hand over to my colleague, Ross, who will explain these ideas in more depth. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much, Robin. Um, so yeah, as, as Robin and I sort of alluded to at the beginning, we are working on an integrated data service, which is an, an ONS-led program, looking at you know, transforming the way that the government statistics and, and data more generally are, um, are published. And I think a big part of that is, is realizing some, some benefits and best practices in, in the way that we're, we're publishing data, things like reuse, comprehension of data, interoperability, discoverability, all that, all that kind of good stuff. And very practically, we've made you know, a big um, part of our role so far has been in making CSVW a core part of, of that solution. We think CSVW is a very viable way for uh, data publishers to, to publish their data and realize some of those benefits. So if we jump to the next slide. As part of um, you know, being part of a, a government organization, organizations generally, there's often you know, lots of standards and recommendations and our own government digital service has put out some guidance saying um, CSV and CSV on the web um, are both you know, good standards, um, which you know, we're gonna meet good user needs and put out some guidance on, on kind of how and when to, to make use of those. And in particular, the, the CSV guidance puts out um, a line which says data publishers should consider whether CSV are going to be read by machines or read by humans. And I think that that's, that's quite an interesting one. So we've got this recommendation from government digital service that you know, publish things in CSV, um, but bear in mind whether it's going to be read by machines or humans. And I think that's, that's quite a key point. Um, if we jump to the next slide, Robin, because what we're seeing is despite these recommendations to publish stuff in CSV, at least in the world of, of kind of statistics and government, uh, in government, we've got Excel and ODS formats, open, uh, open document spreadsheet formats, are still the prevalent way of, of publishing statistics. Go into GovUK and look for some statistics, you're going to find it in the spreadsheet. Um, and I think it's, it's this kind of idea that a spreadsheet is sort of serving two purposes at the same time. It's trying to present data in a way which is accessible for, for humans. So you can imagine cross tabulations of data or you know, using kind of the, the formatting tools in a spreadsheet to kind of make a table look attractive. So there's all that presentational aspects, but then also providing access to, to raw data. And sometimes these presentational spreadsheets are often the, the only source of raw data which is made available. And I think, you know, I, I, at least I've spent a lot of time over the years kind of wrangling data out of spreadsheets, um, so much so that it's, it's, it's very difficult, it's a very difficult job to do, especially to do reproducibly. So without kind of copying and, date, uh, copying and pasting data out of spreadsheets to kind of write code to wrangle data out of spreadsheets, which you have, um, you know, some certainty that that code's going to continue working for you to come. It's a very, very difficult thing to do. So I think a key point is there's this awkward conflation of sort of presenting data and then wanting access to kind of raw, raw data itself. And that's something that we're, we're seeing right across the world in statistics and government at the moment. Reflect the next slide. So recently there was, in response to kind of this idea that spreadsheets are, are everywhere, um, some user research was conducted and they found that actually a lot of statistical spreadsheets are not particularly um, accessible. And um, some colleagues at the ONS, they put out a really interesting blog post and I recommend even right now, if you go and Google dinosaur accessibility spreadsheet, you'll be taken to the page. And there's a bit of an exercise there that, that people can do, which is quite interesting. So they've created this spreadsheet, which is meant to emulate um, sort of the experience that someone might have if they're using a, a screen reader. Um, and the spreadsheet has a set of statistics in it, kind of made up statistics about dinosaurs. I ask some questions um, about kind of, can you determine certain statistics using the spreadsheet? And the spreadsheet looks like um, it's just been completely blacked out. So you open the spreadsheet, you present it with a completely blacked out view of the spreadsheet. You can't see anything that you would normally expect. And you have to use your, your kind of navigational keys um, and the formula bar to try and determine the, the format of the spreadsheet. And I think it's, it's a really helpful and useful exercise because what we find is no two spreadsheets tend to look the same, especially when they're being used to sort of present data. So there's no sort of expected format um, for um, a spreadsheet. And that makes working with the data kind of notoriously, um, notoriously difficult. And I think that there's, there's, a, there's a better way. 
um, if we flick to the next slide, we talk about um, normalized data being accessible. So if we flick to again to the next slide, the recommendations out of um, that accessibility audit was sort of a way to make spreadsheets more accessible. And as part of those recommendations, um, there are a number of like key features in the sort of um, recommended spreadsheets. So things like holding metadata toward the top left of the spreadsheet, having a clear title, having a clear description, but then the format of the data itself, you can see an example on the screen, the format of the data is to sort of avoid the, the more common presentational cross tabulations that you would see in a spreadsheet and instead um, adopt a more like columnar format uh, for, the, for the data. And this we call normalized data, it's the sort of data that um, you would see inside a, a, a database. If you did a dump from the database, you'd see normalized data as opposed to sort of the cross tabulations. If we flex the next slide. In the R community, they, they have a name for this. So R is a statistical programming language, and they've they've sort of adopted the term tidy um, as, as a kind of a, a brand, I guess, for this, this normalized set of data. Um, and there's a good reference um, in, a, in, a, in a reference called R for Data Science, which has an entire section on um, tidy data. And they've built kind of a load of packages and, and software libraries called the tidyverse, which are intended to work with this sort of tidy data what we find is kind of in outside of the r community there's, there's not so much like a name or a brand for this kind of stuff but in, in the r community they called it tidy which, which has a bit of a ring to it but refer to it for um we we'll refer to it as, as, as kind of normalized for, for now so we've reflected it yeah um so on screen we've got kind of an example of, of of normalization in practice so at the top left we've got what would be quite commonly a cross tabulation that you'd expect to probably see in some government statistics We've got locations on the left-hand side. We've got double headers. So at the top, we've got years going across, and then we've got a breakdown into male and female. Um, and the, the kind of the normalized view of this is to take that data set, which is kind of wide, and stretch it out so it's long. So it takes many rows instead of many columns. So you can see uh, toward the bottom right, what I've done is I've separated all the different data points into kind of their own column. So we've got a location column, we've got a year column, we've got a sex column, and then a, a life expectancy column, um, which I think is what this is, is displaying. And that is um, a, a sort of representation of the, of, of the data that you could expect to read straight into some statistical software like R or Python um, and be able to begin operating on the data right away. So no sort of pre-wrangling required or, or pulling out of a spreadsheet or anything like that. If we click to the next slide. That representation of the data is also quite interesting because it allows us to, to, to think of the data as a sort of a, a, a data cube. Um, and this is something that we've made quite a lot of use of in, in, in our work as part of the integrated data service. There's a standard called the RDF data cube, um, which gives a representation of tabular data as this in this kind of cube format. So try to, to, to display as a bit of a, a diagram on screen, but you can imagine that that data set, which has uh, location, year, and sex as columns, um, those could be different dimensions in a 3D data cube. And if you wanted to select, um, you know, certain uh, certain results out of the cube, that you you can fix those certain dimensions. So data cubes are, you know, really kind of um, well studied and, and quite a historic thing. And tools like Power BI and, and Power Pivot and Excel and, and what have you, are sort of making use of those sorts of data cube formats, but ultimately what underpins them is this normalized data. You can also see in the example, I've split out um, additional metadata about some of the, the, the cells. So we've got um, that location column has ONS geography codes. Um, they might not be the most particular um, human friendly thing, but you can split out all the kind of human friendly data into separate CSV files and CSV gives a mechanism to to draw in up those different CSV files together. So I've got a locations.csv file, which contains things like the labels and the descriptions associated with, with those different codes. If we flick over, yep. Yeah. So to kind of summarize where we're at, we've got recommendations from, from GDS to publish in CSV, but we're seeing that spreadsheets are still very prevalent. 
in very recent times, this accessibility audit has sort of highlighted that spreadsheets are not particularly accessible. And here are some recommendations uh, which will make your spreadsheets more accessible. And those recommendations prescribe a, a normalized view of the data. And it's not that much further to imagine that if you're putting normalized data into a spreadsheet with some metadata, that sounds like it's not a far leap to then publish that data as a CSV file. And then all that metadata you're publishing include that as a CSV on the web metadata file alongside. So there's quite a natural progression. We think is a very natural next step for, um, for statisticians across government to, to take that leap from developing an accessible spreadsheet to publishing as a CSV on, on the web. Cool, so linking data together. Um, these, these slides is what I tend to use to, um, to, to, to justify like some of the, the cool features you get from, from putting the effort into this work. So if we, if we jump into the next, next slide. So here I've got two examples of data sets being published um, by, by two different authors who sort of work independently of one another. So on the top left, I've got um, it's, it's trade by industry published by the Office for National Statistics. On the bottom right, I've got um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions by industry published by um, Department for, for Business Energy and Industrial Strategy. So you've got two different statistical data sets here being published, and you can imagine that they, they would have been published in, in spreadsheets up on, on GovUK somewhere. And as a analyst, um, you could quite naturally imagine the scenario where someone's come along and asked, oh, I want to understand which industries are the most valuable, but also the, the most polluting. So you kind of want to do a comparison of, of value versus pollution or something along those lines. So if we flick to the next slide. Um, so as an analyst, I would come along, I'd probably download those two data sets and then begin wrangling them into some appropriate format. And I'd need to begin to eyeball them uh, to see whether they can be compared or whether there's any kind of similar features between them. And in the example I've given on slides, um, I've shown an industry classification which talks about crop and animal. It talks about hunting and related services. And then for the base data set, it talks about products of agriculture, hunting and related services. So as an analyst, I might look at this and think crop and animal, products of agriculture, they're quite similar. Um, and I might make an assumption that they're actually fundamentally talking about the same thing. And another example on screen is you've got um, both years. Um, so for the one data set, it's talking about 2019. Um, for the other data set, it's also talking about 2019. But of course, we know that 2019 doesn't always mean the same thing. It can mean a financial year, it can mean a calendar year. So as an analyst, I'm kind of quite constantly having to make these decisions or make these assumptions and probably capture them in, a, in appropriate logs um, because we're not sure whether explicitly these, these two data sets are talking about the same thing. And that's sort of the power of linked data. So if we flick to the next slide, um, we think that if, if analysts can adopt common identifiers then it gives a mechanism to be explicit about what, what they are referring to. So on screen, I'm showing that crop and animal production and products of agriculture could be given a common identifier as something like reference data.gov.uk slash six slash zero one using the standard industrial classification of the ONS provides. If we can adopt those identifiers, you're making it explicit that we you know exactly what we're referring to. If we adopt those identifiers and they both adopt those identifiers, you get this kind of network effect. You get this kind of um, idea that you're improving both data sets by adopting common identifiers because then that enables the ability to um, link them together because they're both adopting a common identifier. What's interesting is um, by adopting identifiers, which look like web addresses, um, you can take that web address, put it into a browser and discover more information about the resource. And that's, that's quite cool. You can sort of follow your nose, you get this kind of Wikipedia network effect going on. Um, and it allows the ability for you know, this information, more information to be discovered, more data sets using these identifiers to be discovered. And CSVW gives a really clear way of creating these identifiers. So through CSVW, through some of the, the, um, the mapping that Robin showed earlier, you have a way of taking data, which is in a CSV file, mapping it to a set of identifiers, and then sort of for free, you get this kind of linked data representation of the data. Where do you get good identifiers from? That's a problem that we're kind of trying to address at the moment. So things like um, common like classifications and common code lists, often they're published without these linked data identifiers, 
But if we can get to a world where we're commonly publishing things with linked data identifiers, we're advertising them and advocating them for use by statistics producers, and then using CSVW as a mechanism of, of, of representing the data in that format, then for free, you, you get a lot of this, this data linkage coming together. So in summary, um, CSVW is a, is a mechanism for uh, transforming CSV data into this kind of linked data representation with identifiers, and those identifiers are what's allowing us to compare and combine data sets, which is quite a powerful thing. Um, quite exciting. That's me. I'll pass it back to, to Robin for any closing thoughts. Thanks, Ross. Um, yeah, so with the, the CSVW um, is quite quick to say, um, but a little longer to explain. It's actually a stack of other different standards uh, and it can be quite overwhelming at first so we put together a little micro site at csvw.org uh, where you can go to kind of get a springboard into all of this um, I suggest that we move to questions um, now yes thank you uh, thank you very much Ross and Robin um, yes please do enter any questions you might have into the uh, chat um, one, one question that came to my mind uh, as you were talking was, was RDF came up, R came up. Um, these, things, these things seem to me like things that are very much aimed at developers um, and in, indeed a particular kind of developer. That's a very um, particular kind of world that's being described in a kind of a data science world. Um, so I was just wondering what kind of, or do tools exist to broaden the reach of CSVW so that it's easier to, to implement this if you're not maybe a developer and you're just interested in publishing data in a way that's easy to access. Yeah, it's, it's really quite interesting. Uh, if you look at the opinions of people who perhaps aren't particularly keen on linked data and um, what they think of this, and it seems to have kind of bridged a bit of a divide here, which is um, what's got um, myself and colleagues at Swirl so excited about this. We've, we've got a a, um, an expertise in linked data. Um, and I think it's managed to achieve that by the stint of the fact that it's incremental. So um, you can, you, you, you get these URIs and everything for free. You don't have to really care about the linked data representation. And even the example that I showed with the Eastings and Northings, you don't need to, to generate the RDF out of it to make use of that. Even as a human, you can look at that and say, oh, that, that's what exactly what that means. And it's informative quite apart from um, its representation. Um, there, there are um, tools for this. Uh, it's a kind of inevitable um, uh, kind of chicken and the egg, um, put, the, put the gig on and they will come or whatever they say in Wayne's world. Um, and uh, so the, yeah, there are, for, for you would, as you would expect, name, name a, a, a normal language is probably already the beginnings of, of passes if, if not more than one uh, for that language there's a few because the standards composed of a few different things there's a few different purposes to those so some will just be doing parsing so that you can use the csv and get going in your language other ones will be doing translation into rdf or there's, a, there's also a csv to json uh, translation in there as well okay yeah that's interesting and it's, it's interesting how um csv or spreadsheets really there, there's such a kind of lingua franca for everybody that I think a lot of, um, I think some of the ODI's experience and I think probably some of our partners has been that actually, if you want to affect a kind of culture change in um, how data gets published and how data gets used in an organization, actually you do it at the spreadsheet level. If you've got good tools around spreadsheets, actually you've got quite powerful leverage for how an organization works with its data. Um, so yeah, CSVW is really meeting organizations where they are. Um, I've got a question in the chat here from uh, Becky Ghani. Um, do you think there will be a general move towards tidy data rather than cross tabulation, even beyond the open data data analyst community? I think it's a, it's a yeah, it's a great question. I think for me at least, that cross tabulation seems like a way of presenting data and for that purpose it's, it's probably very very much appropriate to, to do so but you can imagine a way where um 
you know, we, we build kind of tools or we build, um, you know, the ability in, in certain websites to take data, which is in that tidy data format, and then translate that into the cross tabulation that you'd want to present to a human for a more human readable view. So I think powering those sort of presentational views from the more raw machine friendly, analyst friendly um, setup is, is kind of a, a way to go. And I've seen examples of this. There's um, the Department for Education have an Explore Education uh, Statistics Service, which is mainly powered off of, of tidy normalized CSV files and then gives um, users the ability to sort of customize a type like a table or customize a, a cross tabulation, which is powered from the, those normalized views. So I think that that decoupling of, of kind of like wanting raw data, which you can use at machine level, and then wanting kind of human friendly presentational aspects of the data is, is kind of key. Um, and definitely like in the R community, at least that, that whole tidy base bunch of packages um, is very much describing the idea that data should be in that format. And then here's all these kind of functions and tools that you can have to work with data, which is in that format. Yeah, you can you can see it um, more. Broad. I mean, anyone working with with databases will take um, normalization as, as kind of as given. Um, but you can see with things like Seaborn and in, in Python and D3 for, for JavaScript users, the, they work a lot better if you have this normalized form and you're not having to mess around at a, a metadata level. You've got um, uh, your the variables in your data are, are addressable directly. Um, and I think there's a sort of, although the, in theory, the, 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 the cross tabulated and the normalized view should be, should have a sort of a lossless projection in both directions, uh, but that's not always um, so straightforward. And it's certainly easier to take the, the normalized view and then project it into a cross tabulation and vice versa. And if you haven't started thinking about that in the first place, you'll find that there are certain descriptive facts that there isn't any place to hang them. And that's why we end up in this world of Excel spreadsheets where color coding and footnotes and you know all the rest of it starts to, to, to come in. Um, we are quite conscious across our um, work that um, in normalizing things, uh, we do sometimes risk leaving behind some of the kind of the, the implicit uh, aspects and uh, some things that are conveyed with the presentation that are no longer there if you're just dealing with, with raw data. And it's really quite interesting to think about how we can um, retain some of that and in what instances it's necessary to make sure that we, there is an accompanying presentational view um, so that, that it, the, the, the hard work that the producer had done in, in making the data understandable uh, is still retained. Yeah, thank you, uh, Ross and Robin, for that uh, for that very full response. A um, lot of interesting reflections there, but I feel like I'm now in the role of a sort of uh, bad teacher, and that there's a lot of interesting comments in the chat from Connor Quinn of uh, I think NHS Digital. Uh, Connor, could you share those with the rest of the class? I'll just invite you to come off mute, maybe, and uh, share some of your reflections if you're comfortable doing that. Uh, yes, sure. Um, although I should tell everybody I'm, I'm um, walking out in the sunshine um, on my phone connection because it's such a lovely day. So if I drop that, that's what's happened. Um, yeah, th this is all super work um, and it's really, really great to see it. Um, one thought, uh, Robin, you asked about how do you migrate forward while still retaining the, um, the existing publications. Part of what we did in DFE was to keep the Excel tables uh, static, so they didn't change for the customers, but we changed the back end so that our code produced the tidy data first, and then that was really easy to pop into cross tab, like you like you said, um, and that was a really nice stepping stone to prove to people how nice it, how easy it can be to produce data this way, um, but without having to grapple with angry customers up front. Um, and then the other point was just around the the data dimension. Uh, if you work in dimensional modeling kind of data warehouse land. You have this idea of a data dimension where you have one row per day, if it's a day granularity, and then a column that captures every possible description of that. So you might have financial year one or calendar year two or you know week number 17. 
Um, and what's nice about it is you just accrue additional descriptors by, by adding more columns. So no matter how weird the business logic of, of, of the arcane use case, you can just append it. Um, and it's one of the big difficulties across departments. So if, if that's something that could happen centrally, it would be very, very helpful. Yeah, one of the, the beautiful um, things about that realization is that if you continue with that a little bit further, and then what happens if you want to have data descriptions of the columns in your data description is that you end up in linked data land. And once you start normalizing normalized data, um, you get to what um, is called triples in RDF. Um, so that the, um, uh, for example, the, um, the the, the date itself then gets a description and then that description itself then gets a description and you might describe the nature of the description in terms of the properties and what they mean and what their label is and who introduced it and what, how long it's been valid and what it was replaced by and the values themselves then get their descriptions and it's, it's, uh, it's triples all the way down. I thought I'd mention the, um, we, we make use of a, a, a service um, reference.data.gov.uk has a, a sort of a time date service. Um, so they've they've coined a bunch of these identifiers for you know different categorizations of, of dates and times. So things like financial years and calendar years. And by um, taking one of those identifiers and, and putting it into the browser, you can get back um, a response of data which says things like the 25th of March 2022 is in the month of March. It's in the you know it's in quarter two or quarter one, depending on whether you're, which kind of year you're working in. Um, so that's quite an interesting one. It's one that we make quite a lot of, a lot of use of. Um, time is infinite. So it's one of those, um, those, those tricky things we come across sometimes is like, you know, you're having to, you're having to categorize, um, you know, minutes and days and months. It's, it gets big quite fast, but it seems to do quite a good job of that. So. Uh, we've got another question in the chat from uh, Rick Moynihan. Uh, Rick, are you happy to come off mute, uh, or would you prefer me to uh, ask that question for you? Um, yes, sure. So um, I was just wondering if one of the things you haven't really touched on is um, the potential for sort of CSVW as a data annotation tool and as a hypertext format for sort of a web scale linked relational database. So I don't know if it's worth explaining things from that angle too. Yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, so the the three uh, on the web calls these this this metadata that you that you add the, the an annotation uh, and um, the nice thing about it is that it, it then provides a way that you can annotate a given file and talks about how you can link the two together and find one from the other and then it also provides a set of um, vocabularies that you can include in there but you can include pretty much anything else you like in there to varying uh, degrees of convenience um, and so whereas I mentioned briefly in the spreadsheet land you end up with footnotes and, and color coding and all the rest of it and um, we can actually keep those in uh, in a in the annotation in a structured way and use vocabularies um, um, for, for cataloging or things like um, schema.org which is an attempt from the world's search engines to come together and agree some terminology. Um, and um, so you can kind of start to add in any arbitrary annotation that you want into, um, into your metadata. It doesn't just have to relate to the columns um, and uh, URI templates and that sort of thing. Um, the I don't I know exactly what you mean by a, a, a hypertext format. I presume you're talking about um, um, as, a, as a media type and, and, and embedding it. Do you, want to, do you want to elaborate? Yeah, sure. Well, just that you can use essentially URI templates to join, to sort of join um, tables and, um, you know, and make relations essentially across tables. Um, connecting, you know, um, say observational data and dimensions and stuff to the reference data and things. And then obviously there's a lot of potential then for that to sort of where you don't necessarily own the, own the uh, reference data, you can essentially link to it and then just present that to users as a, as a hypertext format essentially so that, you know, they can just follow their nose as Ross was saying and 
you know, browse from from a table of observations or something to the reference data, which is hosted somewhere else on the web, and that essentially anybody can annotate tables anywhere on the web. I guess as well as another aspect. So. Yeah, yeah. So there's kind of a also a corollary of of normalization that if you're going to have a uh, a, a table that has kind of one purpose in mind, one type of thing in each row, um, then the information that you want to describe things that are tangential to that has to go somewhere. And in a spreadsheet, you just you put it in another spreadsheet and no one thinks too much about it. And of course, in a relational database, it's, it's this very formal link about what's going to correspond to something else that's sometimes implicit in a spreadsheet, or maybe you have to dig out and find a VLOOKUP in there or something to figure out what's supposed to be happening. Um, and as Rick says, the uh, CSV on the web provides these, um, tells you which the relational keys are between two tables and brings tables together in what it calls a table group. Um, so yeah, it sounds a bit grandiose, but it, I think it's fair to, to, to refer to it as Rick has there as a web scale uh, linked relational database, if in uh, only in the sense of the how the data is expressed and identified, if not all of the kind of um, you know indexing and all the the exciting stuff that you get with a with a the natural sort of native relational database. So that's a very uh, appealing vision, um, and I think this idea of unifying data in that way and connecting in that way is one that's really um, sparked the imagination, certainly of Tim Berners-Lee in the first place, um, and and ongoing since then, and certainly it's part of the Open Data Institute's uh, continuing vision of, of how the, the web might work. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any more time to explore that vision. Uh, can I just ask you, Robin, could you bring up that slide one more time with the website link on there, just so that people can find out more about CSVW and get involved in the conversation there? Um, and uh, in addition to that, I'll just say thank you very much to you all for joining. Thank you all for, thanks to you all for participating. And thank you, Robin and Ross, for joining us here today and uh, sharing your knowledge uh, and the potential of CSVW. Thank you very much. Thank you.